Okay, then here's the intro. I made two videos about animal phenologies, and I received at least one vaguely intrigued comment. So, bet, here are some animal conlangs. But first, a word from our sponsor, Air Up. Do you like water, but wish it had flavor? Buy some flavored water. One of the things I'd like to do is set out some lore. The wandering island of Shavor is one of the seven factions in the world of Terra Macra. The premise is humans die out, probably the raptor or something, and sea level dropped. Not just back to pre-industrial levels, but it dropped hard. Which brings me to the sea squirt. So, as sea level drops, tunicates become a staple of the intertidal. Using the push and pull of waves in addition to their own siphon action brings them closer to the surface, but it also makes them reactive to the environment. It gives them a reason to stay, at least partially, motile in their adult stage. But like I said, they'd need a lot of pollen to fully emerge from the surf. Probably even a symbiotic relationship with plants, but I've got a remedy for that too. So, one of the rarely discussed features of global warming is the replacement of coastal salt marshes with mangrove swamps. Mangrove is a blanket term for any salt-adapted tree. Mangroves easily outcompete shrubs when they come into conflict, however they can't survive cold temperatures. Global warming eradicates those and the mangroves spread. Without humans, global warming stops going up, but it doesn't just disappear. The mangroves are here to stay, and the tunicates gradually climb from the sea to feed on pollen. But that's not what I'm focusing on today. The point of turning sea squirts into sky squirts was so they could use wind in their pharyngeal slits to make vibrations. They can use this to mimic bird calls. They lure in birds and supplement their diet by feeding on them. Now, is any of this likely? No, but the rapture exists in this universe, so cut me some slack. Birds learn to avoid this by creating more complex calls, the tunicates respond with more mimicry, and so on and so forth. It was under these circumstances that the birds first evolved spoken language. Now, language emerged eight separate times. Today we're only examining one that evolved in ravens in Florida and the coastal plain. At the time we view Terra Macra, these languages are still in their infancy. Chavarese is almost definitely a proto-language. Now, the language we observe today, Kakalian, is much less infinite than chivalries, but I still get to use 3D geometry to explain the phonology, so let's go! So if you watched the last video, birds are very limited in terms of consonants. They basically have nine distinct consonants, of which Kakalian uses these three, represented using these symbols, and consonants can only appear in the onset, so they're referred to as hard attacks, even though that term means something different in English. But a majority of the vowels in Kakalian are just in hiatus rubbing up against each other, so let's talk about those vowels. Kakalian has nine distinct vowel phonemes. This is fewer than most bird languages, but still confusing for humans, seeing as birds have no soft palate, no larynx, and a giant hole in their hard palate. But as I've said, vowels is just frequencies. In humans, we control these frequencies using various mouth shapes, but you can replicate it on different hardware. Blah blah blah, comforting British man explains it better than grading American boy. Birds, rather than using a single human larynx, have a syrinx divided into three segments, each of which can operate separately, so they could extend the vowel quadrilateral into a 3D cube? Well, obviously you can tell shapes, it's a triangle, not a square. Why? Well, let's look at a simplified version using binary for low and high. In that case, the cardinal vowels are U at 0, 0, A uh at 1, 1, and E at 0, 1. Now, F1 is the lowest frequency and F2 is the second lowest. You can't really hear anything to the left of 1, 1, you just know that F2 is high. Anything to the right of A is 1, 0, and if you think about it for a second, you'll realize that the lowest frequency can't be higher than the second lowest frequency. So, three cardinal vowels, and if you add a third frequency, it has to be higher than both F1 and F2. It has only one option where it can be less than one. That creates one new cardinal vowel. What shall we call it? Well, ur because it already exists. The third axis is R coloration. As promised, this uh, pyramid type thing is the 3D vowel space. Now, ur is uncomfortably heavy in the mouth. Ur, which is not a cardinal, is about as deep as you want to go, but birds have better hearing, so they might be fine with going deeper. But it, now is not the time for equivocation, so I declare this is the vowel chart for Terra Macro's birds. Here on the graph are Kakalian's nine vowel phonemes, and here's the table with transliterations. Now, Obviously, they wouldn't use these names to refer to vowel qualities, they would use left, right, and tracheal to refer to which segment of the syrinx constricts to raise frequencies. So, what about diphthongs? Well, because hiatus, you can't really tell the difference between two vowels next to each other and a diphthong, however, they do make a difference between cloven vowels and bending vowels, or the technical terms isonumic and allonumic. So, 
in humans, if you try to breathe in while speaking, it works, but it hurts and sounds weird. In birds, it's fine and sounds normal. Some bird languages make a distinction between inhaled and exhaled sounds, but Kakalian doesn't. However, it can tell whether two vowels that are next to each other are both inhaled or exhaled, or if one was inhaled and the other was exhaled. Now, switching from inhaling to exhaling is treated the same as exhaling to inhaling, so we use the plain terms same breath and different breath. Isonumics are the default, and allonumic sounds are represented by the hyphen. Oh yeah, and there's long vowels. They're represented by a double vowel. So, grammar. In chivalries, we kind of skipped that step and sent the raw meaning to be articulated, but in Kakalian, I'm going to have some fun. Parts of speech in Kakalian are nouns, verbs, and adjectives. However, it's probably better to divide the nouns into subjects and objects, because there are really two forms for every noun. Now, you may be wondering, hey... Isn't that just nominative and accusative? We have that in my language. But it's different because in Kakalian, objects and subjects don't line up. The subject, wa, or bird, refers to any bird or sometimes any intelligent creature, but the object, mi, a, only refers to a Kakalian-speaking raven. You might be wondering if this extends to other cases like dative or ablative. It doesn't because they don't exist. While English might say, I jump over the river, with river as the center of a prepositional phrase, Kakalian glosses jump over as one word, and river is the object of that. Now, there are five noun classes or genders. These don't determine how the adjectives decline, however. Rather, there are four adjective classes, and they determine which ones you can pair up. Think of it this way. We might describe a man as handsome, but a woman as pretty. Now, you might be saying, wow, Zinioff, that made me even more confused, and also it was kind of sexist. It's Pride Month. Be better. Which is fair. It's a hard concept to translate. Basically, masculine nouns can be described by any adjective, feminine only by positive and neutral, neutral by basic, complex, or negative, untouchable by negative or complex, and inanimate nouns only by basic adjectives. Obviously, the subject and object that share a definition need not have the same gender. Does that make sense? Verbs are the only one that inflects, but who mama do they inflect? Verbs inflect based on the gender of both the object and subject, the voice, the motion, the aspect, and intensity. That entails active for when the subject is doing something to the object, passive for vice versa, middle for when there is no object. Now, motion is that thing I was talking about before where jump over is one word. We've got six of these, plain or accusative, ablative for from or out of, allative for to or into, adhesive for at or with, contressive for against, and peres for around or through. Yeah, I stole the names from noun cases. Aspect is time. We have timeless for things that just kind of happen, perfective, aorist, and you gotta have the subjunctive for things that just kind of don't happen. That leaves intensity. A lot of verbs can't really be intensified, but for those that can, the option's there. So that leaves some adjectival uses of nouns, like prepositional phrases and possessives. Those are accomplished via suffixes attached to a noun, but this is doubly tricky, because the adjective not only has to match the noun it's describing, but also the root it's billing off of. Yeah, we've got time for an example sentence. Let's do... Those beasts of Shavor are just fish with worms attached to their faces. Yeah, the Kakalians are pretty racist. They're kind of the villains of Terra Macra. So, start with a subject. Rather than using beasts, I'm using ooh, oh, which is actually a pretty nasty slur. However, this negative meaning gradually accumulated, so it's still neutral rather than untouchable. In English, the lemma of a word is the singular, and the plural is derived off of that, but we have some collectives like candy and water where the singular is derived off. In Kakalian, mostly every noun defaults to collective, and the plural and singular are formed off of it separately. That means we name them slightly differently, so the plurative is formed by swapping the length of the final vowel. Now we can go back to the adjectives. So, noun-derived adjectives occur before the subject, and regular adjectives occur after. That's for the subject. For the object, both types occur after. Of shavor is a pretty cut-and-dry genitive, so you tack on the suffix ne to the noun navor, which is neutral, so it can form a basic adjective, which can describe a neutral noun. Everything checks out. Likewise, the determiner of those, in this case ah uh, uh, is basic. And now the monster that is the verb. So, to be is the most important verb in any language, and in most of them it inflects unusually. But Kakalian is a proto-language, so it doesn't really have unusual words besides loan words. So we start with rua, which then inflects. Both the subject and object, beasts and fish, are neutral, so that means we include o with a breath switch. It's active, plain, and to be is usually just timeless, so we include ie. And then I'll incorporate the just as a more intense version of to be, so we reduplicate the final vowel with a breath switch, leaving it as oh, ah, oh, yeah. fish is 
Rai, and it's a third gender, so it has access to all adjectives except for class 2. For the sake of simplicity, I'm translating this as worm-faced fish, so the suffix for a reverse possessive Li la forms a complex adjective. Luckily, the word for face, la, is also neutral, so it all checks out. Unfortunately, though, the other suffix doesn't match. The suffix for with worms attached to it forms a positive adjective, which can't be applied to a neutral noun, so we have to settle for with worms on it, which forms a complex adjective. Worms are an untouchable noun. Ra, oh, you attach the suffix, ah, and the whole thing becomes now or now. If you want to see more from the world of Terra Makra, give this video a like. If you don't, cry about it, I'm gonna do more.